1992 as a network news cameraman filming the LA riots, I came to wonder how we as a society had come to such a level of hatred. I decided to look back to a period of time, the 1960s, when people wanted human rights, when people thought they could change anything. And I wondered what happened to those people? What happened to that movement? And my questions became this documentary, All Power to the People. is that there are more slums that Negroes are living in in the United States of America today than there were 20 years ago. The fact is that the Negro is more covered up in ghettos today, more segregated in housing today than 20 years ago. The fact is that schools, particularly in the North, are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court rendered its decision outlawing segregation. These are the hard facts. I'm not trying to solve these problems. We've got to rise up. We've got to organize. We've got to mobilize. And we've got to work to solve these problems. Well, it was a very controlled exercise. We were told what time to come into town, where we could march, where we could not march, the kinds of signs that we could carry. Um, the speakers were told what to say. When you say march on Washington, you get the, 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 the perception that people are coming there angry or no, they're going to do something. Uh, it was a picnic. The um, final thing was we heard Dr. King's I Have a Dream. So everybody was mostly clapping and so on. I felt quite sad uh, as I looked people because it was an empty dream to me. America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. The idea whose time has come today I had responsibility for protecting his life on the march from Selma to Montgomery, and I spent five or six absolutely sleepless nights down there. We'd drive, I'd drive back and forth from Selma to Montgomery, and I'd look at every tree and around every corner and wonder, and up on the roof and wherever. 
any sniper could be because I, I could feel the hatred drawn toward that place that wanted to kill him. And we had identified about 1,200 people who had histories of personal racial violence. I mean, they had tried to kill, they had assaulted, or they had murdered people on account of race, as far as I know, all whites, killing blacks. And here they were coming, they were drawn like a magnet towards Selma to Montgomery. And the man walked in the valley of the shadow of death for years, and he feared no evil. There were a lot of lynchings and things that went on that you never heard about, because the news never got left the South. And uh, the federal government had taken a larger position of standing by and observing what was going on. The F FBI was not doing anything to protect the rights of the people who were peacefully demonstrating. When you say power structure, I know you mean the white power structure because that's all we have in America. And the white power structure today is just as much uh, interested in perpetuating slavery as the white power structure was a hundred years ago. Only now they use modern methods of doing so. A blacks being beaten by the baseball bats and fire hoses and and the dogs being sicked on blacks, marchers and protesters, and people who find the boat, it was uh, a very bitter pill to accept. If you only ask for crumbs, and, you're, and the granting of those crumbs causes bloodshed, what do you think will uh, be caused when you ask for a loaf of bread or a bakery in which to bake your own bread? Okay, let, me, let me continue with uh, this one. There had been a very intense struggle, too, around the question of the denying black people the right to vote and access to public accommodations. And the South had been the focus of much of that struggle because uh, that's where the contradictions were most blatant. As long as the masses of black people are involved in the struggle for freedom, not integration, but freedom, and respect uh, as human beings, respect as men, and show that they're willing to die to be respected as men, then the power structure sits up and takes notice. Dr. King's a man of unparalleled nonviolence among public figures in American history. And he studied nonviolence, and he studied Gandhi, and he studied Tolstoy, and he studied Thoreau, and he absorbed their vision. And he came to understand that it was the only way that we'll avoid destroying ourselves. He could look at Hiroshima, and he could look at our massive arms expenditures and how it starved people and blew their bodies apart and all the misery of it. He could look at soaring crime rates, and he knew we couldn't go on like this, and he pleaded with us. Hoover felt that one way maybe to silence Martin Luther King would be to invite him to his office. J. Edgar Hoover said that Martin Luther King was a liar, and Martin Luther King had accused him of being a racist in his uh, selection of FBI agents. So Martin Luther King said, um, I will go to Washington and I will have it out with him. I will certainly make him take that back and apologize to me. And then he did come to see J. Edgar Hoover. And they went down the hall and walked in an office together to talk. Finally, I inquired, and they said Martin Luther King had gone out the, out of the door on the other side and had left. Something influenced Martin Luther King because I understand that at the end of the conference, he uh, told the press that uh, I think something to the effect that uh, Hoover was a great man. J. Edgar Hoover, who was believed to have had a number of tapes of Martin Luther King experiences with women and that Martin Luther King was uh, horrified and, and that Hoover had accomplished his aim of shutting up Martin Luther King for the time being. Martin Luther King, poor boy, is, is uh, under the influence of the Foxes. I should say under the control of the Foxes and has been used by the Foxes to lead the poor sheep right to the slaughter. Malcolm was not afraid to speak the truth and this was an eye awakening to people in general. I think even some of the whites started to see some things they could not see before. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. 
And a fox is almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. They falsely accused Malcolm X of being violent, which Malcolm X did not because all he taught people was self-defense. And self-defense doesn't mean you go out and attack someone, but you do have the right to defend yourself by any means necessary if you're in that position to defend yourself. Malcolm, to us, represented a voice why should the black man need some legislation to prove that he's a human being when you don't need any legislation to prove that whites are human beings? So I make this point because to come right back to my initial statement at the outside of the program, you will never get real freedom and recognition between black and white people in this country without destroying the country, without destroying the present political system, without destroying the present economic system, without rewriting the entire constitution it would be a complete destruction of everything that america supposedly stands for before a white man in this country will recognize a black man as something on the same level with himself heads of governments and, and, and leaders of uh, revolutionary movements listened to him and were convinced that there was a legitimate problem a human rights problem that black people had in the united states which was being covered up and concealed he hated all the things that decent people should hate he hated racism and hypocrisy and oppression and the tyranny of those in power and what he loved he loved humanity but of course the humanity in this country because of the racism was not the kind of humanity that anyone could love it would have to be a society that would have to be changed completely. I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you. After Malcolm was assassinated, I was at the Audubon Ballroom the day that it happened. It was a terrible thing to witness. And there are a lot of things that happened there that day that I don't understand, that have not, and a lot of questions that have not yet been answered. People are still trying to puzzle out a piece together what really happened and who was re really responsible in terms of the actual participants. We know that the United States government planned it, did all of the plotting, and utilized the, uh, used the Nation of Islam and some of Malcolm's own people to bring him down. I found out later on after research that Gene Robbins was on the stage when Malcolm X got assassinated. He was a gold badge carrying detective. If you define what a bodyguard is, it's distinctly just that. You guard somebody's body with your body, and that makes you a bodyguard. So now how come any of wasn't there is beyond me to jump in front of the bullets. They ain't supposed to be off the stage, down the stage, around the corner. Those are not bodyguards. The CIA is completely very powerful in this country. Nobody knows how powerful. The CIA had uh, liaison projects with uh, police forces all over the United States. There was a chance of detente between Malcolm and, and King at the time of Malcolm's assassination. Two of the people arrested for uh, the murder of Malcolm X were people that had not fired a shot that had hit the victims. These uh, activities were run by the counterintelligence staff of the CIA. It was put in counterintelligence in order to bury it as deep as possible within the agency and prevent exposure. I find it uh, a little strange that the FBI has informant files on so many people who end up assassinating someone. If the CIA was doing it in New York, imagine they were doing it in country after country around the world. Ah, well, if they had not killed Malcolm X, probably the Black Panther Party would not have evolved. I found these 
Declaration of Independence piece, that first two paragraphs that said, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected them with another, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism. Well, this kind of phrase and this kind of thinking and our understanding, particularly to where I was coming from and my decisions to help to create this organization was all about this need to change and alter the government to evolve some community control kind of political power back into the hands of African American people in the black community. So we went down to the Warren Poverty Office, three blocks from my house, it's right there in North Open. And we sit down and decided right there by October 15th to start writing out this 10 point platform and program for this new organization. Many people don't understand that the Black Panther Party's 10-point program and platform was basically a statement of principles. And it was around these principles that we organized in the black community. Point one said we want power. We want power to determine the destiny of our own community. And it went through a series of issues. We wanted decent housing. We wanted to determine the destiny of our community. Decent education taught us about our true history. Uh, we wanted fair treatment in the courts, juries of our peers. We wanted to end to police brutality. We wanted a relevant education that taught us who we were and our role in society. Uh, we wanted land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. We wanted to organize political, electoral, black community power. The point was not to show what the government was not doing. The point was to show the community how the community could empower itself and how the community could organize. So we wrote this program, 10 points of what we want, then 10 collateral points of what we believe. And these principles and, and stated uh, objectives of the Black Panther Party were the heart of its program. We still didn't have a name for this organization. I had gotten a pamphlet from the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. So I said, Huey, why they got this logo for this panther here? And another point that day, Huey said, you know, I think the nature of a panther is, is that if you push it in the corner, and if it can't go left and if it can't go right, it's going to tend to come out of that corner to wipe out the aggressor who pushed it in the corner in the first place. I said, that's what the races have done, Huey. They didn't push us black folks into the corner. And we decided to name it the Black Panther Party at first, and then we said, well, wait a minute, we're going to take position on self-defense and me and Huey agreed in the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So that was the night, October 22nd, the finalizing founding evening night. Because this is what happened. Huey was saying, okay, we're going to have to have some officers. So I flipped the chairman, a coin, a silver dollar. I flip, I say, heads, I'm chairman. Boom, it landed on heads. I say, I'm chairman. I go ready to hand Huey the silver dollar, and I pull back. I says, you don't need to flip. So Huey say, uh, what do you mean I don't need to flip? I says, wait a minute, Huey. I says, there's only two of us. Oh, that's right. Uh, I says, you automatically minister defense. So I got chairman. <laughs> Huey and Bobby said, we want to immediate end the police brutality and the murder of black people. That was rampant in the Bay Area, all over the country. It's always been a society of working class whites pitted against blacks. They had nothing else they could do but be police and try to come out of their uh, Oklahoma Dust Bowl, I'm gonna kick your ass nigger kind of attitude. There was a, uh, an incident where a police had shot a black man in the back and then went and planted a gun next to him and said that the guy had drawn a gun on him, which we found out after the investigation, the guy didn't have no gun. Police had shot him in cold blood. Then they had another example where another black man was shot. But every young black man that was being shot during that time, the police never got indicted for murder or nothing. If anything, they got a promotion. Oakland has one of the highest infant mortality rates among black people across the United States. Add to that miseducation, unemployment, police terror, and the rest. This all helped give rise to the Panther Party at in that particular place at that time. The real first patrol was down on 7th Street in West Oakland, California, where 11 or 12 brothers that night, Huey, Bobby, little Bobby Hutton, Forte brothers, Sherman, who was also a part of that first cadre, and Albert Bitman Howard. I'm telling Huey on the walkie talkie because I'm riding in the lead car. Huey, we got a policeman down here. There's a lot of people down here in the corner. Let's get out here, man, because he's arresting somebody. We pull over, we park legally. 
We're a hundred and some feet away. We all pile out the cars. We're a well-organized group, and we're observing the police under the law, and we're not going to take any crap from them if they do try something. But we want to recruit the people. We're trying to capture the imagination of the people in the community to let them know. I think somebody I remember saying, what they got? Sticks. Because, you know, it's dark, and people don't expect to see people with guns, black folks, right? And it's, it's nighttime, like. And somebody said, man, no, them some goddamn guns. And somebody said, I'm getting the hell out of here. Huey tells this brother, he says, I'm getting out of here. He says, no, 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 you don't have to leave. We're a new organization. We're the Black Panther Party. We're here to observe these police out here. We've been brutalizing our people in the community. So please stay. we researched the law. Everybody know we have a right to observe the police. Well, that got the police's attention. He stands up. You have no right to observe me, he hollers at Huey. But Huey says, no. Huey is citing the specifics of the damn law. And some sister in the audience said, well, go ahead on and tell it. And another the brother said, what kind of Negroes is these? And the cop says, well, is that gun loaded? He said, if I know it's loaded, that's good enough. This scene, man, is a scene where, bang, when Huey says, if I know it's loaded, that's good enough, it calls little Bobby to say, yeah, that's right, I have not jacked around the chamber. And the other brother with the long guns, and the cop turned around and saw all these people jacking the rounds off in the chamber. It blew his mind. He was awed. He stepped over to his arrestee. He opened the back door. Unconsciously, he protected the arrestee's head, put him in the car, shut the door. Then he stopped to look at the sister. And he was shocked because the sister had the earrings on. That well, female was even there with a big old 44 strapped down, something like Clint Eastwood or something. Well, what are we doing? We passed out the 10 point platformer program. Political education session meeting is at 2 p.m. at 5624 Grove Street up in North Oakland. Please be there, brothers and sisters, because we're going to organize some political electoral community power in the black community. That's how the Black Panther Party got started. The party was able, came on the scene at a time in which black people um, had become increasingly frustrated at uh, conditions in this country. Uh, the whole black revolt was, as far as I was concerned, a little late coming. They should have gone forth with their activities much earlier than they did. I came into the Black Panther Party uh, and knowing about the Black Panther Party, uh, as a student at San Francisco City College, uh, you had people such as uh, Mimar Baraka, which was known as Leroy Jones at that time. You had Kwame Torre, which was Stokely Carmichael at that time. And you had Rap Brown, and you had Sonia Sanchez, all those different people. It was through going through the Black House, uh, I came in contact with some brothers named Huey and Bobby, who used to come through there from time to time. May 2nd, 1967, when I led a delegation to the California State Legislature, 24 males and 6 females. Well, Ronald Reagan was on the lawn, all the little kids he was speaking to out there on the front lawn left. These are little white kids, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 years of old. They came over, they thought we was a gun club. You need 30 yard 6 on the little kids in saying. But the press followed them too. Therefore, I read Executive Mandate Number 1, written by myself, Huey Newton, and Eldridge Cleveland. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. That gave us international notoriety because we were arrested and we was all bailed out the next day or so, etc. and boom. At a traffic stop, an altercation occurred. A police officer was killed, Huey Newton was wounded, and went to jail. Uh, I will be uh, free uh, providing that we're successful in the battle that we're engaged in now, and that is to uh, revolutionize the court system. It all depends upon on this uh, problem. Huey was facing the gas chamber. Uh, Bobby Seale and a handful of all the other members who'd gone to Sacramento were in jail. They were serving time. So it really wasn't much of an organization. At that point, the, actually, the Black Panther Party had totally fell apart. It didn't exist. I was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, so I came out then in November of 1967 to uh, work with Eldridge, organizing the support around Huey's case. 
Do you have any money? Uh, no, I'm, I'm in a severe state of poverty. What about the Huey Newton uh, Defense Fund? Uh, I don't know too much about the Huey Newton Defense Fund, actually. Who's paying Newton? your attorney's fee? Uh, I believe the Huey Newton Defense Fund. <laughs> I come out of jail. Eldridge Cleaver is back because Huey has been shot. He has put out one issue that says, Free Huey. Free Huey! Peoples of the world are demanding that Huey P. Newton be set free. So in defense of our lives, for the survival of black people and human beings of the world, we all say in solidarity that Huey P. Newton must be set free or the sky is the limit around the world. I reorganize and restructure the party. I extend the rules of the party in a matter of two months to 28 rules. You know, I create uh, the captain and David Hilliard's position and stuff. I create all of this stuff. Black Panther Party has revived, it's changed its name from the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense to the Black Panther Party. It's become a very widely acknowledged organization in the Bay Area. I was deputy chairman of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Put me in touch with a lot of people in the Panther Party. The alliance uh, was formed in 1968. The Panther Party emerged in Oakland, California and did not have a national base. SNCC had a much longer history, had uh, in many ways more seasoned activists. H. Rap Brown was drafted into the Black Panther Party as Minister of Justice. Kwame Ture was, uh, or Stokely, was drafted as Prime Minister of the Afro-American Nation. James Foreman was drafted as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Director of Political Education. I can remember seeing on television people like Stokely Carmichael and others. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. Against all forms of racism. And they were scary to me even. So uh, if it would shock a person like me being in the CIA, certainly the ordinary society and the elites, above all, who run the United States, would have been very threatened. Black power means Dignity! See, it's no in-between. You're either free or you're a slave. There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. That we must arm ourselves. That we are in imminent danger. That the concentration camps in Tule Lake, in Arizona, and Oklahoma are now being rejuvenated we set up for us, and we will defend ourselves. Uh, I don't believe in guerrilla warfare. I think it would be both impractical, ineffective, and immoral. Uh, so I can't uh, believe in this at all. I think we must see, on the other hand, however, that the young militants are in the revolutionary spirit. And uh, they are concerned about revolutionizing uh, certain values that have been existing in our society that need to be revolutionized. And I think the other thing that we must see is that, as President Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible only make violent revolution inevitable. When we start saying the war is wrong in Vietnam, well, people looked at us like we were something out of space. But when they talked about the other day of the Gallup poll being 58% of the people against the war in Vietnam, then we see if you're right, you have to stand on that principle, and if it's necessary to die on the principle, because I am sick of the racist war in Vietnam when we don't have justice in the United States. They're a bloody good bunch of killers. We're going to commit troops to the Vietnamese people, the National Liberation Front, uh, to fight the cowardly American aggressor. Who's and with it? The, the Black Panther the Party. Panthers. That's right. The question is whether our nation has the will 
And I submit that if we can spend $35 billion a year to fight an ill-considered war in Vietnam and $20 billion to put a man on the moon, our nation can spend billions of dollars to put God's children on their own two feet right here on Earth. I'm going to uh, make this known uh, at the Paris Peace Talks so that uh, it can be accepted or rejected uh, by the Vietnamese people. But in the spirit of internationalism and the spirit of international solidarity, we plan to do this, and we would do this for any people who, who are fighting against American you imperialism. Get, you want to get to... I've heard several comments from people that was talking about with the people, for the people, and by the people. Being a black woman from Mississippi, I've learned that long ago that's not true. It's with a handful, by a handful, by a handful. But we don't change that, baby. We are going to change that because we're going to make democracy a reality for all of the people of this country. And I say that that is a great need now for a radical reordering of priorities in America, and that is a great need for a revolution of values. Difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. and slums through America and all the places he'd been. You put it on the map and the places that Dr. King had been is where they came out <laughs> in rage and bitterness that this could happen to this non-violent prophet of social change committed and driven to create social change to achieve social justice for all the people in the society and in the world.
some were happy uh, if they went, you know, if they thought black men should be killed. I was just driving into Marlon Brando's house up in Beverly Hills. He was lying on the bed when I went in. I said, uh, "Have you heard the news?" He says, "What's that?" I said, "Martin Luther King was just shot dead." Marlon didn't say much. He's as though he was in one of his movie roles. He got up very silently and said, so King is dead. And he went into the telephone and called up the Panther office in San Francisco. Meanwhile, he all, I told his secretary to call the gun shop and order up a number of pistols, or rifles, and so forth and so on. I said, uh, Marlon, what are you going to do with those? He said, I'm going to shoot my way all the way to Washington, D.C. Martin Luther King, I think he was killed, just had a plain um, hatred, a racial hatred. Hoover hated Martin Luther King, it's just that simple. And he, he wanted Martin Luther King destroyed because he, he felt that he might be a messiah for the black people. The CIA, uh, the DIA and others, uh, we still don't know uh, all of the dynamics because we're just finding out now about the military intelligence. When our brother Martin Luther King exhausted a means of nonviolence with his life being taken by some racists, what is being done to us is what we hate, and what happened to Martin Luther King is what we hate. You darn right, we respect nonviolence, but nonviolence on the part of who? On the part of racists in this country, on the part of the racists who've infested the police department, who are organized and maintained by the power structures. We want nonviolence, just like Martin Luther King. But to sit and watch ourselves to be slaughtered, like our brother, like he who was shot, etc., we must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. Two days later, they murdered Bobby Hutton in the shootout. It had happened two days after Martin Luther King. About 50 police were shooting into this one house for 90 minutes, and they didn't know who was inside. They threw in tear gas canisters to force the people to come out. The tear gas canister, one of them, exploded and caught on fire. So this was a burning basement. Uh, Eldridge and Bobby Hutton were the only people in that basement, actually. Um, Eldridge told Bobby Hutton to take off all his clothes because when he went out, if he was naked, the police would be shocked and they wouldn't shoot him. But he was embarrassed and he only took off his shirt. So when he came out with just pants, um, he was immediately shot by seven or eight policemen and killed. Bobby Hutton was 17 years old. He was a black panther. He'd been a black panther. He was one of the original founders of the Black Panther Party. This was not a police action. It was a search and destroy mission. Uh, it was very clear that it was about killing, that the police intended to kill panthers. That could have been my son lying there. And I'm going to do as much as I can. I'm going to start right now. What happened for the party after that was a tremendous upsurge in community support. People gave lots of money, gave lots of t time. They could see all the things the Panthers were saying were actually true. The fact is that some of our fellow citizens have turned against our society and turned against our government. People perhaps that you do not see, people that perhaps you do not come in contact with. Only 40% of the men that live in the ghetto have jobs that pay more than $60 a week. How can you support a family? How can you bring up children in dignity? Robert Kennedy is the only man on the current political structure that can do the job that we need done. Is there a second choice? There is no second choice as far as we're concerned. Now let's on to Chicago and let's win there. Is that possible? Is that possible? It's possible, ladies and gentlemen. It is possible. He has not only Senator Kennedy. Oh my God! Senator Kennedy has been shot, and another man. 
a Kennedy campaign manager, and possibly shot in the head. I am right here. Rayford Johnson has a hold of a man who apparently has fired the shot. He has fired the shot. He still has the gun. The gun is pointed at me right at this moment. I hope they can get the gun out of his hand. <laughs> Be very careful. Get the gun. Get the gun. Get the gun. Stay away from the gun. Stay away from the gun. His hand is frozen. Take a hold of his thumb and break it if you have to. Get his thumb. All right. That's it, Raper. Get it. Get the gun, Raper. Hold him. Hold him. Hold him. <coughs> we don't want another Oswald. that the police must be brought under control by any means necessary, including through force of arms. And we have never bit our tongue about that. We say it now loud and clear. We will always say it. We're not afraid to say it, that these racist Gestapo pigs have to stop brutalizing our community or we're going to take up guns. We're going to drive them out. It is time that everybody understand that the Black Panther Party has not been trying to shuck and jive anybody. We've been trying to move this struggle from a lower to a higher level. All the people who sacrificed their lives in all organizations, not only the Black Panther Party, who are political prisoners, etc., must be defended. We understand that fascism exists in America, and we are going to create, and we're going to put together, and the year is coming, and the work that faces us in the year is coming, the very near, near future, an American Liberation Front to combat the avaricious businessman, the demagogic politician, and the fascist pig cops who murder, brutalize, and terrorize the people. The Panthers were able to spread across the United States and exist in a number of cities. This massive, fast, rapid growth of the Black Panther Party happened all in that period, and it was almost like a reaction to Brother Martin Luther King being murdered in that particular period. The murder of um, Bobby Kennedy helped solidify most of the coalition politics that went down. And I think it was really um, uh, initiated by the Panthers who believed that we needed to unite uh, people of all colors. Because our objective was to coalesce with the Brown Berets, coalesce with the American Indian Movement, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the way we were going to change things, is by people of all colors coming together. So we have a commonality there, a basis for unity that leads to a common struggle, if not a common result. You know, after because the people wanted to do something, they wanted to were tired of being spit on, being discriminated against. They wanted to uh, rise up, and that's what was happening with the Red Power movement. The Rainbow Coalition was started by Fred Hampton in Chicago. We said that we would work with anybody and form coalition with anybody that had revolution on their mind. They were the ones that really came out and started uh, showing us how to. Uh, organized successfully. Racism is an excuse used for capitalism. And we know that racism is just, is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Fred Hampton had met in prison a young Puerto Rican gang leader named Chacha Jimenez and told him about the Black Panther Party and its programs and how it's serving the people and its revolutionary goals. And he had come out and turned his group, the Young Lords, into an organization very similar to the Panthers. A number of us worked closely with them. I personally worked closely with the Black Panthers uh, Party chapters out of Washington, uh, Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon. There was a group in Chicago called the Young Patriots of Appalachian young whites who were very radical. There's a Chinese group. The name was called the Iwar Kun. It was like, we call it the Red Guard. And we had a group called the Brown Berets. Uh, these were the models or the institutions that we were creating which would themselves, by example, educate and show the people that this is an alternative. These were some very intelligent, legitimate, uh, and kind and generous people. And for those of us who, who took that step inside and who, who, who opened 
our doors as well, it was a relationship that would last a very long time. I had an incident happen where I was jumped on by a gang on the south side of Chicago. And when I went to the police for help, the first policeman who was near the site in a, in a police car, when I stumbled after being beaten for a while and my friend was still in this building being beaten, and I told him what had happened, he looked at me and said, so what? And uh, I was shocked because this, this is not the way it was supposed to happen. That's not the way it would happen on Leave it to Beaver and Ozzie and Harriet. All of a sudden I began to see what was going on all around me. And I started getting involved. I, I tell people now, when I talk about it, I tell people it wasn't the Panthers that made me a Panther, that, turned, that made me decide to join the Black Panther Party, it was the New York City Police Department. When I did join the Black Panther Party, you thought that you just had to have a gun and that was it. And I was totally wrong. What you had to do was pick up some books and start to educate yourself. Huey P. Newton had the capacity to mediate and meditate on all these confluent uh, and sometimes competing uh, elements in the history of modern thought. The Black Panther Party was different in the sense that uh, it considered itself a revolutionary nationalist organization, the ideological heirs of Malcolm X. We stood for the creation of a revolutionary society where people of African descent would be given the right, not given, because the process uh, involved in this ideology was one of the people take their rights. Mao Zedong's writings, in particular the quotations from Mao, which is known as the Little Red Book, proved very effective for that because it helped us to develop the discipline and, um, uh, and the techniques necessary to do our community work. I hear this a lot from young people saying they had no idea there were any women in the civil rights movement. They had no idea there were any women in the Black Panther Party. Of course there were women. There were women leaders in the civil rights movement. There were women leaders in the Black Panther Party. I was the central committee member. Uh, I was the communication secretary of the Black Panther Party. The persons who tended to have the most sophisticated an intellectual understanding of revolutionary concepts and ideology and who had more maturity and sophistication in organizing skills tended to be women. Women like Afeni Shakur, Joan Byrd, Asada Shakur, uh, Kathleen Cleaver. There were women at every demonstration. There were women who were arrested in some of the shootouts, such as the Los Angeles office when they paraded all the Panthers out. Among the people arrested were women. There were women on trial, such as Erica Huggins, when Bobby Seale was tried for a conspiracy to commit murder, so was Erica. It wasn't like the women's section or the women's auxiliary and the Man Panthers. We're all in this together. We were involved in the process of re-socializing and re-educating ourselves as black men to the contradictions of sexism in the black community. This was a powerful thing that the, that the Black Panther Party was about. Again, with the programs like the breakfast program, the, uh, the health clinic, the prisoner visitation program. I remember the sickle cell anemia program. Check this out. In 1968, the Black Panther Party, sickle cell anemia was not noted in the United States like it is today. I mean, health care is essential to your life. And to be denied health care because you don't have the money to pay is like saying, well, your life isn't worth anything. And so to have this clinic available and the clinics that exist today because of what was started then, these clinics provide a service that is invaluable. We were constantly 24 hours a day doing something, working with our community and supporting our community and cleaning up our community. These are not the types of activities that are done by a gang. Jesse Andrew, who was the uh, treasurer of the state of California, said that the uh, Black Panther Party was feeding more hungry children than the United States government. 
But as far as the, the food program, we went out to the merchants in the community. I mean, we would ask them a simple question. How much of this money that you've made within the, in your business have you contributed back to the community? And 90, over 90% 90 of them said zero. And we approached them for canned goods or food or day-old or bread or, or fresh food, whatever the case may be. So they donated. And that's how we got to serving people in the community who didn't have food or went to school on an empty stomach. And so at 5 o'clock in the morning, you'd have to get up from the Panther Pad over there and go over to this breakfast program, start up the stove and make the breakfast, and then make sure it's ready in a timely fashion. And it's a hot breakfast with the sausages and the eggs and the grits. And if it called for us to stay there and scrub the walls and do whatever was necessary, we would do that. We feed about 10,000. Uh, across the country each day. Well, of course, we started our own programs too. You know, the American Indian Movement. We started, and but we patterned them after, after uh, the Black Panthers uh, organizations. We had free breakfasts, free. Uh, we built schools. We have our own clinics. Uh, we went into, of course, communications. A lot of the things that the Panthers did, uh, we patterned our ideas off of. You know. The Young Lords Party and the Black Panther Party wanted every municipal hospital that serviced the poor in New York to have an acupuncture experimental center inside of their drug program. And because we were the first, we became targets. A hundred policemen came to the Bronx and arrested us and take, took us away from the center. When these efforts started to show a little bit of success, when the government moved in. COINTELPRO was the code word for counterintelligence program, and it was a program that the FBI created in 1956 to go after the Communist Party with intentions of trying to neutralize the party, put it out of business. In 1967, they start what became known, known as MH Chaos, a code word for illegal domestic operations within the United States. We can say that COINTELPRO was a kind of codification for white supremacy in America because the function of the FBI was to preserve white political, social, economic supremacy in America. Counterintelligence staff under James Angleton uh, was not the only uh, CIA office which was involved in illegal operations within the United States and with the general um, uh, attempt to get information on the foreign hand in the protest movement. The Office of Security was uh, another major effort by the uh, CIA. I've seen top secret documents from the White House authored by Nixon communicating with J. Edgar Hoover specifically about the Panthers. Hoover had well, if you want to call it an enemy list, uh, had lists, but uh, it's difficult to say what uh, what Nixon's men had. They, they, they pulled the water gates, so <laughs> I guess they could do just about anything. The Black Panther Party was looked at as the number one threat to the internal security of the United States of America. These are word by word verbatim quotes from J. Edgar Hoover. Year of 69, every branch and office of the Black Panther Party in one way, shape, fashion, form or another was attacked by the power structure, law enforcement agencies, and so on. The people walking around out there look like walking wounded, you know. It's just like they've been in Vietnam. Victims of gun battles and sieges and, and isolation and torture and destroyed families and dead parents and nobody knows about them and nobody really cares and that story is one that hasn't been told yet. At the University of California at Los Angeles, two Black Panthers were shot to death during a black students' meeting on the campus last Friday. Two FBI informants in the United Slaves had uh, shot and killed uh, Bunchy Carter and uh, John Huggins on the UCLA campus. 
uh, us organization slapped a member of Black Panther Party at the time, Elaine Brown. I was going with John Huggins, so when she told him that somebody from the US organization had slapped her, he pulled his pistol out. This is when the two brothers, or supposedly Steiner brothers, supposedly steps out from behind the doors and open fire and uh, kills John and, and kills Bunchy. And the FBI agent who was controlling two informants was concerned that some white students might have been shot on campus. The members of the US organization were taken from the crime scene with the FBI. The government, or whoever, Power, Cointel, whatever, they were able to kill a party when they killed Bunchy. When they killed Bunchy, uh, they killed the party. We just didn't know it. April 1st, 1969, we were taken down to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in the wee hours of the morning after having been um, roused from bed by teams of uh, machine gun toting policemen. Gene Roberts had the dubious distinction of having been Malcolm X's bodyguard when he was assassinated. He was one of the major agents uh, in the Panther 21 case. They brought us all in, put us in one room. They brought Ralph White Sedan, the other undercover agent, with a sort of shotgun, and they brought him in with his head down like he's under arrest, took him in another room, and they brought, had Gene Roberts sitting in another office, sitting down, looking like he was depressed, like he was arrested. And it was down there that we realized that uh, there were three undercover agents that were actively involved in framing us for the charges that, for which we were arrested. After they get the conspiracy charges on you, they let the agents out the side door. And they go back out in the community as nothing's wrong or they were still Panthers when they wasn't Panthers at all. They were just agents that infiltrated the Black Panther Party. Most of the Panther 21 spent two years in prison after a trial that lasted um, 15 months. A jury came back with a not guilty verdict in 45 minutes on all 150 counts of conspiracy. It was a colossal victory to have um, defeated the state's attempt to criminalize uh, the leadership of the Black Panther Party. Eldridge Cleaver, the Black Panther leader who fled to Cuba to avoid being returned to jail, arrived in Algeria today to attend the Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover today asserted that of the black extremist groups, the Black Panthers represent the greatest internal threat to the nation. In his report for fiscal year 1969, Hoover said the Panthers have perpetrated numerous assaults on police and have engaged in violent confrontations throughout the country. Fred Hampton, who, by the way, I would I would look at as one of the true leaders of the Panthers. Extraordinarily talented. <laughs> Twenty-one years old, uh, articulate. Watch some of his films. Hear him speak. Here was a dangerous man. He could persuade people that there was injustice. <laughs> that uh, the United States ought to be changed. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace because the people that we're acting for peace, they're a bunch of megalomaniac warmongers and they don't even understand what peace means. He was the heart and soul of the Chicago uh, chapter of the Black Panther Party. And just a, just an awesome motivator. We ain't the oppressive, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. 
and he began to forge coalitions between various street gangs or youth organizations in, in, in Chicago. And, and by doing that and by being a charismatic leader and being uh, one who could mobilize uh, the people, particularly the youth, he became noticed by the federal government. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. And you're going to have to keep on saying that. Uh, the FBI never killed, personally killed any Panthers. They always had uh, local police departments do their dirty work. And they began to devise a scheme that culminated in his assassination while he was asleep, drugged by his security officer who was also uh, a, a police informant. City police in Chicago um, murdered Fred Hampton. It had happened apparently about 4 o'clock in the morning on a December 4th. I didn't hear about it until 6 o'clock that night because I wasn't in town. And they popped this picture up on the screen. Actually two pictures, one of Fred Hampton and one of Mark Clark. And uh, I was just stunned. I was staring at the screen and I realized I was crying. They shot that place up in ways you couldn't believe. His wife, pregnant, shot up in the bed there. She survived, as did the fetus, but Fred's body was riddled. The walls of the room riddled. You could count scores of bullet holes there. He never got out of the bed. He was murdered right there. 2.30 in the morning, they claim they're serving a search warrant. But don't we know anything about human rights? You don't serve a search warrant at 2.30 in the morning. You don't come crashing in with guns blazing and kill people who sleep in their beds in the United States of America, or do you? In essence, was uh, an assassination authorized by the FBI or sanctioned by the FBI. The criminal conspiracy unit of LAPD, their mission in life was to investigate uh, extremist groups, primarily the Black Panthers. And the FBI had a special unit uh, called the S2 unit. They euphemistically called it their racial squad. Their focus was on the Black Panther Party. So the FBI's um, racial squad and the LAPD's uh, criminal conspiracy section worked literally hand in hand in bringing down the, the, the LA Black Panther Party and its leadership, Pratt in particular. When uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins had been assassinated, uh, Pratt became the leader of the Panthers and now the FBI had to get rid of Pratt. Geronimo Pratt was a Vietnam veteran. He'd been a paratrooper and won many medals in Vietnam, including a Purple Heart. He trained all the Panthers in Los Angeles on how to defend the office against attack. He was the defense minister, uh, so he was clearly somebody that the FBI was out to neutralize. December 8, 1969, Los Angeles Special Weapons and Tactics. Criminal Conspiracy Section, LAPD, FBI. Black Panthers, as we all know, were destroyed as an organization through these illegal FBI operations. And uh, certainly the CIA violated the privacy and the rights of thousands upon thousands of Americans through the illegal operations which they agreed to do under Richard Helms as director. Any and everything was done to members of the Black Panther Party to destroy not only the Black Panther Party and other organizations, but to demoralize people, to discredit us in the eyes of the people, to criminalize our existence in the consciousness and minds of the people. It's physical violence and torture, per se. There's nothing modern about it, 
and there is nothing sophisticated or scientific about it. It is the base against which psychological warfare has its meaning. We went to interview Dr. Matulu Shakur, who had cured thousands of drug addicts with the experimental treatment of acupuncture. We found him in an underground prison. The Black Liberation Movement in 1969 lost something like 43 people were killed and something like 785 people were arrested and put in prison. In any other country with the population that new African people represent, in any other country in the world, that would be considered war. We went to interview Mumia Abu-Jamal, the Peabody Award-winning journalist. We found him awaiting execution on death row. In essence, when one looks at the aims and objectives of the federal government through the FBI, by way of the COINTELPRO program, what one really sees is a war against black America, a war against um, any uh, in the words of the finals, in fact, the emergence of a black messiah who could lead black America. In 1970, there were tremendous trials. The United States government began to try to sweep up all of the leftovers of the 60s into these major conspiracies. And they had the Black Panther trial, the Chicago 7 trial, the LA 17 trial, the Wilmington 10 trial, RNA 11 trial. There was just tons and tons of these types of trials. Many of our people went to the wayside psychologically, emotionally, and physically. 15 hour shootouts, Philadelphia, New Orleans, Los Angeles, San Diego, the frame up of hundreds of Panthers across the country on ridiculous trumped up charges. I was arrested, I was 19 years old. We were the first Waco. The New African, New Bethel incident, when the police came in, uh, the Detroit police came in there to try to shoot up. Everybody in that church, men, women, and children, were having a peaceful demonstration to try to kill them. They were shooting under the pews. They were shooting at little children, running and crying. There's nothing to me has been more painful out of all the people I know that died in Vietnam than those comrades who died out here in the streets. There is nothing, nothing. <laughs> In 1970, my good friend Julio Rodin of the Young Lords Party was killed in the New York prison called the Tombs. If they were doing it in Vietnam and it was um, perfectly legitimate to go out and kill as many Vietnamese as one could, uh, or Viet Cong as one could, then uh, why not kill enemies in the United States? Today, a judge set Newton free on $50,000 bond to await a new trial. Newton's last trial and manslaughter conviction were overturned by a higher court this year, so now he'll be tried again. And in the meantime, he is out on bail. He is back on the street. Before Newton got out of prison, the founder of the Black Panther Party sat and talked about his plans for the Panthers now. Uh, I plan to uh, go on with our, our uh, expansion and also to, uh, to make even a stronger tie with the uh, struggling people of the world because they represent two-thirds of the people. J. Edgar Hoover today characterized the Black Panthers as the most dangerous and violent throne of all the extremist groups now active in the United States. There were forces afoot 
trying to undermine the relationship between not only myself and the leadership of the Black Panther Party, the national leadership, but between the various forces within the Black Panther Party who wanted to make the Black Panther Party more responsive and democratic, and those who wanted to maintain the Black Panther Party as an extension of, of, of autocratic control of, of Central Committee. The Central Committee of the Black Panther Party, when I come out of jail, I reorganize it again. Huey then was actually opposed to this. I said, no, we have to have a broader Central Committee. Because when I come out of jail, Huey was sitting there with him and David, he went to jail, and Elaine Brown and a couple of other people and said, this is our Central Committee. And I said, Huey, this whole uh, Supreme Commander crap has got to go. And these are the private conversations I had with Huey, you know? So my point becomes, he was trying to absolutize himself. We had, we had felt that, um all the contradictions that was happening between David Heard and all the other people in the party and the central leadership and the breakdown in centralism and all that would be resolved when Huey came home. When Huey came out, uh, Geronimo remained a member of the Central Committee. For whatever reason, uh, Huey, uh, after he got out of jail, uh, he wanted to have the total control of the party, but the way the party was set up with the Central Committee, uh, that was uh, impossible. Uh, Geronimo being one of the strongest uh, personalities on the Central Committee uh, just had to be eliminated. It was around this time that Elmer Geronimo Pratt uh, was, um, was captured and branded as an as a, um, agent by David Hilliard and the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party on the West Coast. Of course, this was a total fabrication. Geronimo was not an agent. In fact, the um, the individual who pointed the finger at Geronimo and declared him an agent, Melvin Cotton Smith, was himself a police informer, an agent, who was assigned to Geronimo by David Hilliard. A split apparently is open in the leadership of the Black Panther Party. On a San Francisco television talk show, Huey Newton, in the studio, talked with fugitive Eldridge Cleaver, speaking by telephone from Algeria. Cleaver said a purge of Black Panther members is tearing the party apart, blamed it on David Hilliard, and demanded the ouster of Hilliard as Panther Chief of Staff. Many of those confrontations, both on the West Coast and between the East Coast and the West Coast, happened because of the COINTELPRO program, what they call Program Brown Mail. They would write to one person and sign their letter. They would write to another person and sign each other's personal signature. And it really cracked the Black Panther Party in two by creating two factions. All of this was happening at the same time that Huey Newton was planning his itinerary to come back east. And the government used the hysteria and the paranoia around these issues to give Huey the impression that the New York Panthers were unloyal to him. They wrote to people, in my name, sign my signature. And these were crazy letters that were written by the FBI. And Jeff Ford got a letter from Chairman Fred. Of course, they thought those letters were from each other. And the, the tone of the letters were um, incendiary. Well, you're a punk. Uh, if I see you, I'm going to you know, shoot you. Uh, you're a coward. If you had guts, you would come down here. I mean, it was, it was literally an attempt by this government to incite violence. COINTELPRO was the whole cause of the split between the different faction in the party that caused the death of Sam Napier. In terms of the actual physical integrity and well-being of the Panther, Sam Napier might have been the most important person. Uh, the newspaper was the most important entity and tool uh, and institution that the Panthers had and he was in charge of the paper. The loss of Sam Napier wasn't just the loss of a person who, um, who was a paper salesman. It was like a spirit in the party, a strong, positive spirit that permeated the whole party. Uh, and uh, you lost a, like a friend, a brother. Robert Webb was the ranking panther on the entire East Coast. He had the rank of field marshal, which was a central committee position. It was an underground secret rank. The police knew who these people were. The police knew that they had orchestrated this conflict.
and they gloated over it in their documents when they said that they could take credit for, for the murder, for Robert Webb's murder, and that they can take credit for the irreconcilable differences in splitting the Black Panther Party. When Huey Newton came to the Northeast, we in New York were responsible for his security. The government knew this through their agents and through the mail. They sent um, threats, death threats to Huey Newton, purportedly coming from us on the East Coast, saying that, uh, you know, we were faithful to Eldridge Cleaver and that when Huey came back East, we were going to kill him. And it was up at Yale University that Huey Newton uh, sort of like got extremely paranoid. I was told that I was suspended from the Black Panther Party for threatening his life. So life is very tough and uh, a funny thing happened to all of us on the way to the grave. Huh? <laughs> Huey, David sent me underground with Geronimo but with no intentions of, of us being successful but with the intentions of us eventually being killed. I think their plan was that we would be killed by the police uh, we would then become martyrs. They would be able to raise us as martyrs and, and go on with their own program. Uh, I followed orders, did what I was supposed to. Geronimo followed orders, did what he was supposed to. And then we end up uh, being in the middle of the split between the Black Panther Party, and they use that as a reason uh, to expel us and, and, and to uh, break with Eldridge. And at the same time that this was going on, the Panther 21 in prison were contemplating writing an open letter criticizing um, the leadership of the Black Panther Party um, around various issues. It was only two things that could happen, that we could either do, spend the rest, go to prison or, or the cemetery. Um, and knowing that people like Truman Myers and Robert Webb and Sam Napier, Fred Bennett, and Fred Hampton had made the ultimate sacrifices. That meant that we could either back up and, and give up and let them win, or we could struggle against it. On one end, we had the, the um, Huey people who were out to do us in, and on the other side, we had the government who was out to kill us. So we, we were in between the, the rock and the hard place. Out of that came the birth of the underground, the Black Liberation Army, the armed wing of the Black Panther Party, whose stated purpose was to start and initiate an offensive military campaign against the forces of reaction. Blah came into being when those who did political work above ground, when they were more or less from the repressive forces, was forced underground because of their political work in the community. Then they became part of Blah. So basically it was taking the war to the enemy instead of waiting the enemy to bring the war to you. And that's what the Black Liberation Army was about. The public at large has a hard time understanding how often innocent people are wrongly convicted. The Los Angeles Police Department, the DA's office, and the FBI were determined that Pratt should stay behind bars. And so they tried to find some other case to bring against him. And they finally decided on an unsolved murder case called the Tennis Court Murder that came out of Santa Monica and charged him with this on the basis of some shenanigans involving a FBI informant named Julio Butler. Julius Butler said at Pratt's trial he was not an FBI informant. We have a ton of material that clearly indicate that Butler was a, uh, an FBI informant. As an example, here we have an FBI Federal Bureau of Investigation, August 19, 1969, and all the information he was giving the FBI during that interview. Of course, the FBI is going to place itself in a position of being able to deny whatever happens, just the way uh, they're denying that uh, Julius Butler is, was an informant. Butler said that he has written a letter containing information relating to an involvement of BP members in an affair that could put them in a the gas chamber. And they had a, an informant file, and Butler was contacted about three dozen times, but they said, well, he's not an informant. Butler said that he was expelled from the BPP in August of 1969. At Pratt's trial, he said he was not expelled, that he quit. Now, according to FBI's own records, their own telephone tap. They later 
realized that Geronimo Pratt was in Oakland at the time of the tennis court murder. The ballistics person uh, came in and testified that the bullet taken from the victim did not match uh, ballistically the barrel of the gun. Well, the way they, they got around that was they had Julius Butler, as part of his confession, tell the jury that not only did Pratt confess the crime to me, that he did it, but he also told me that he threw the barrel of the gun away. So that took care of that. The counterintelligence program had successfully divided the Black Panther Party into two opposing groups. And the Newton group had barred any members of its group from having anything to do speaking on the phone, talking to, and definitely not testifying in trial of the other group. Geronimo Pratt had been expelled. He was in the other group. And so almost all the people who had attended these staff meetings in which he was present, in which I was present, were unable, upon pain of being expelled from the Panther Party, to testify. This murder, in Geronimo's case, clearly was not Geronimo. Then those government agents need to be brought to justice. And that's, that's, uh, that's the responsibility of people in this country at this point in time. The FBI is considering an attempt to try to smash the Black Panther Party. They stopped actually attacking us. Didn't mean they didn't have no covert crap going on. Infiltration of cocaine into the Black Panther Party, its leadership, uh, Huey P. Newton being the main target. And every once in a while I say, I says, why are you snorting this cocaine? This ain't the thing. Now, I don't say this because I'm trying to destroy Huey's character. What I'm trying to tell people is you have to learn to know the whole truth. I had a um, clear impression that uh, chemical warfare would be utilized against the Black Panther Party. We had taken a position in our rules against anyone shooting heroin and narcotics found would be immediately dismissed from the Black Panther Party because we essentially were anti-drug in our operations. Uh, I'd say in my analysis and reflection and research that there were mind control operations run against the Black Panther Party as well as a lot of other operations, uh, psychological warfare programs. And when I say chemical warfare, I'm talking about chemical substances like alcohol and cocaine. MK Ultra was what you might call a research program by the CIA to determine if psychotropic drugs, mind-altering drugs, uh, might be used um, for intelligence purposes, either for chemical warfare, for um, the interrogation of intelligence assets, or the neutralization of, of uh, targets. See, you have to remember, if you read some of the COINTELPRO documents, they had a psychological profile on Huey, on me, on Eldridge. They knew they could use Huey, and they knew that they could trick Eldridge into a certain level of thinking. So, what, I mean, they, they had developed this over a period of time. Now, here we got a situation where you got some party members that talked to me that they believe Huey got duped in to, on a small scale level, methodologically destroying the party. And uh, the party basically went from a people's organization to Huey's private army. That's basically what happened. It was agreed that I would run for mayor of Oakland. And then Huey insisted that Elaine Brown had to run for city council woman at large. We lose the goddamn campaign. And then I found out May, late May 1974, that Huey was trying to take over the drug trade in Oakland, California. So I said, Huey, the party is over. The committee will resolve itself into executive session. The room will be cleared and swept. Uh, no director of the National Security Agency has ever before been required by Congress to testify in open session. There is a great deal about the best intelligence service in the world that we would be pr proud to tell, to bring into perspective what we have had to say recently about the missteps or misdeeds of the past. I believe that I could go back over my experiences in the Justice Department and find some areas in which the Bureau is not fully accountable to me. Yes, Senator. 
William C. Sullivan, who retired as the FBI's chief investigator six years ago after a falling out with J. Edgar Hoover, was killed in a deer hunting accident in New Hampshire today. Sullivan was 65. Bill Sullivan, who was the number three man in the bureau in charge of Division 5 domestic intelligence, expressed extreme remorse to me about his role in a suggesting an anonymous letter to um, Martin Luther King for Dr. King to commit suicide a week before he was going to be called upon to testify before the House uh, Committee on Assassinations. Uh, he was out in a pasture near his uh, New Hampshire home and he was mistaken supposedly uh, for a deer by a young man out hunting and uh, was killed. I understand from uh, the news media that the son was an experienced hunter and I don't know how an experienced hunter could mistake a man who's dressed in a red plaid jacket for uh, the head of a, a deer. I mean, I have never seen a red deer, but you know, maybe they're out there somewhere. But if I could get a virtuous woman in the house, who's the boss? Well, um, in a human society, there aren't really any bosses, but who is the real leader and who is the uh, person who, whose uh, words uh, are most meaningful uh, to the party as a whole, there hasn't any question about it. I mean, it always, that, that Huey is that person. I had the distinct impression consistently from 1971 that Ms. Elaine Brown was a highly placed intelligence operative inside the Black Panther Party. I think Elaine Brown came in through Earl Anthony and uh, she followed the same course of devious type of uh, activities. So uh, I'm saying all this to say that they got involved with people and uh, caused a lot of problems, but we was aware of it. We just wasn't aware of the extent that the LAPD the federal government with its coin tail, the CIA, FBI, we wasn't aware to the extent that these people were involved. She acknowledges in her own words, in her book, Taste of Power, that in fact she had been educated, groomed, taught at the hands of a longtime Central Intelligence Agency operative, J. Richard Kennedy, who Anyone can find out about in David Garrow's book, The FBI and Dr. Martin Luther King. So many party members literally have told me they believe this, that this woman was connected some kind of way and got step by step, piece by piece, got Huey hooked over into some notion that he could get more money behind the scene if he step by step methodologically demised the Black Panther Party. We've always wanted to represent the will of the people. They're not interested in socialism at this time because they believe that they can get their just desserts in this capitalist system. When, they, when the people democratically want a change in system uh, to a socialist system, then the party will be uh, the first to uh, have solidarity. John Stockwell, former station chief of the CIA in Angola, he said, well, I want to say this to you very clear. The Huey P. Newton that people see today is a direct result of operations run by the Central Intelligence Agency to ensure that he would turn out the way that he is. Some people have a, um, uh, a distorted view of me, and it gives me very much trouble. It's, it adds to the sort of timid personality that I already have. It makes me uh, uncomfortable. Uh, because I know that I can't give them all of those things that their idol is supposed to. And uh, I don't want to appear to them a fake, but I would just like to tell them that, uh, that uh, you know, I'm just another regular human being. <laughs> Huey P. Newton was never the same. He eventually became Dr. Huey P. Newton, Ph.D. He eventually became a crackhead, and he eventually was assassinated 
in Oakland in 1989. In the course of our journey, we discovered that certain individuals involved in the demise of the Black Panther Party were also the same individuals who were involved in the demise of the American Indian Movement. It uh, began in 1973 after the church committee hearings when they proclaimed that they were never going to execute covert operations against dissenting organizations. Yet, at the very time that they were conducting such an operation against the American Indian Movement, a program directed towards the American Indian Movement very similar to the program directed against the Black Panther Party. The same bag of tricks in each case. You have uh, a very concerted disinformation campaign. You have the insertion of infiltrators and the development of informants. Uh, the use of the infiltrators as provocateurs, attempting to convert bona fide activists into provocateurs or disruptive elements within their own organization. But they literally would unleash death squads to make sure that the people who were living on the $1,200 a year in the tar paper shack would continue to live on the $1,200 in a tar paper shack. One of the personnel who were involved in persecuting and later framing Geronimo Pratt was also involved in the um, fabrication of evidence to convict Leonard Peltier. This was uh, an FBI agent by the name of Richard W. Held. Well, Richard the Elder, which is Richard G. Held, was basically one of the architects of COINTELPRO. Strangely enough, both the father and son were involved in the operation on Pine Ridge, which uh, led to the uh, frame-up of Leonard Peltier on murder charges. Basically the paramilitary operations of 250 to 300 FBI agents, SWAT personnel on the reservation for about a three-month period of time to once and for all break the back of the American Indian movement. Armored personnel carriers with heavy machine guns, M-16s wearing camouflage uniforms, um, overflights by uh, Phantom F-4 reconnaissance jets and Huey helicopters, and uh, remote sensing devices. It was very much like what was deployed in Vietnam at that time. When the people went into Wounded Knee, there were chiefs and elders and some of the American Indian Movement members. These were the Ogallala people. They didn't have any weapons. They went in there peacefully. They were surrounded with uh, machine guns, armored super, uh, personnel carriers, uh, so the people picked up arms. And, you know, there were no uh, comparison what the government had. We shot back. It was uh, self-defense. The government spent nearly a billion dollars in the military operation on Pine Ridge. And that's a billion 1975 uh, or 1973 dollars. That's probably more than all the money invested in social programs on that reservation from 1870 onward. A people's movement to control the resources and land on the reservations happened to coincide with uh, the energy crisis in the, in the Black Hills. There were at least a dozen large multinational corporations, energy corporations involved. And the government purports to represent the people, but it really represents vested economic interests. The movements that are working for positive social change threaten the interests of uh, the transnational corporations, and the government is essentially an instrument of corporate policy. leader of AIM, the American Indian Movement, had been in jail for 20 years. We finally got permission to interview him. Three days after we saw him at Leavenworth, he was moved. No one knew where to. Leonard Peltier is a prisoner of the longest war in the history of the United States. That's the war against the indigenous people of the United States. And he didn't shoot anybody, he didn't kill anybody, yet he was convicted because two FBI agents had been killed and somebody had to pay. The question then becomes what is he in that cage for? 
And the answer is to serve as an example. An example of the arbitrary ability of the government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations for liberation of native people, all native people. He serves that purpose. So long as he's there, even though it's known that he's not guilty of the specific offense for which he was convicted. He's been sentenced to two life sentences. But finally, they admitted in the last um, argument of the case in November 1992 and that they didn't know who shot the two FBI agents. They said it several times in different ways without any ambiguity. We don't know who killed the agents. We don't know who fired the fatal shots. <laughs> and yet here's Leonard Peltier serving these sentences. We're addressing President Clinton to give clemency to Leonard Peltier in the name of simple justice now. The United States Army, of course, has its uh, contingency plans for putting down civil disturbance in the United States. Uh, they had these programs in the 1960s called Cable Splicer and Garden Plot for uh, entering onto the scene in the event of civil disturbance in the United States. Uh, these activities continued on into the uh, 1980s, uh, but the main agency that became involved in the, on the civilian side was FEMA the Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency. The FEMA has created a great deal of paranoia, probably for very good reason. Their, their whole reason for existence is to, uh, is to take control and keep things going in time of a crisis of you know, earthquake or military crisis. In the, in the instance of a military or political crisis, we don't know what extremes they're willing to go. They have, they've drawn up their martial law plans. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that grew out of the military contingency planning, such as uh, Cable Splicer and uh, Garden Plot, was the military assistance to the police forces in organizing these and training these SWAT uh, squads. So these are, in fact, outright militarized um, uh, police units, uh, even though they are civilian. And the United States military, the Army particularly, had uh, much to do with the establishment of these uh, units uh, through the 1960s and into the 70s. Uh, now, I think all the way across the country, there are SWAT units everywhere. And uh, they started out in places like Chicago, I believe, and Los Angeles. But uh, they were done with the help of the U.S. military. Well, Rex 84 was a plan to draw up to, to collect dissidents around the country who might be involved in violent activity and throw them basically in detainment camps. Some people call them concentration camps. They had, I believe, something like 17 military installations selected in the United States where they would house up to, I believe, something like 150,000 or 250,000 people in the event that the, uh, the streets turned to chaos uh, if Reagan had invaded Central America in the early 1980s. So. Uh, despite uh, what the director of FBI, uh, the FBI may be uh, saying uh, currently, uh, you can assume that they're still conducting covert operations. They were going to round up every dissident and every person who took to the street, plus a lot of foreigners, uh, at the same time, because they did not want to have the situation develop as it had against Johnson and Nixon uh, over the Vietnam War. So in the early 80s, Reagan said, uh, all he had, to, he, it was all prepared, the statement uh, declaring martial law, suspending the Constitution, and then they could go out and take everybody over to these uh, military reservations, the equivalent of concentration camps, and just hold them there until uh, what he wanted to do was done. The government is definitely shifting um, intelligence resources um, to the private sector. And one of the reasons for this is to escape um, 
uh, public scrutiny under a law such as the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act only applies to government agencies. You have to imagine technology 20, 30 years in advance of, of what we're using today. All that is classified, and it's classified for a very good reason, because it's being put to criminal uses. Bugging and interception of private communication, uh, the, the disappearance of privacy, you might say. Um, what's going on now is that there are large private corporate databases accumulated uh, that accumulate information on uh, individuals, track their activities, track their uh, economic activities. Their, uh, these corporations would call themselves uh, credit corporations or um, whatever, but they're essentially intelligence operations. Please listen, my brother and my sister, too. Although these lines may not apply to you, but we need less killing, less killing, more chilling. We can reach the pinnacle if our mind is willing. Let's drink and more thinking what the hell is shot you. Our minds, body, spirits, what the hell is shot you. I mean to suggest what the hell is shot you. We can live a little better. I do profess to see the soul needs to the bottle, bottle to the joint. It's a domino effect to forget my point. The joint to the coat, the coat to the door. And you know what? You wake up, either dead or broke. If the ultimate weapon is a major subsidy, we will use it. It is worth it. It's worth fifty million dollars this year if, if that's what it costs to buy a three million dollar crop. If it'll do the job. Now it may be there be social problems and the political problems and the rest and their embarrassment that won't do the job. My guess is that fifty million dollars wouldn't do it, but it is worth it to this country. If that will do the job, pay fifty million dollars. How it is that the United States, with all its military services, the Coast Guard, the CIA, the FBI, the DEA, and cooperating agencies, including local police departments, how they are not able to suppress the drug trade in the United States, how they cannot seal the borders and stop these shipments coming in, and then the whole distribution system. The nature of the drug use and the availability of drugs began to change as the Vietnam War went bad. Specifically, there was a shift um, um, from the availability of relatively innocuous drugs like marijuana and hashish on the street to um, those drugs becoming relatively scarce due to federal drug programs and there um, appearing instead a large quantity of a very pure, very cheap heroin. DEA, FBI, CIA, uh, military, they're all into this um, international narcotics trafficking. Uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that any particular target is only the, the um, area of one intelligence agency because there are all kinds of interagency uh, working groups in which they uh, coordinate their activities directed toward a single target. The drug trade always supports the government's internal political agenda. It has never not supported the government's internal political agenda. For an example, the phenomenon that we saw with the Nicaraguan situation, with the, which we call the uh, Iran-Contra affair, Iran had less to do with the Iran-Contra affair, in our opinion, than Colombia, because it was the Colombian drug pushers which opened up avenues for finance that the United States government could not get legally from the Congress. Some of the Hmong uh, tribes, tribes people were involved in the production of poppies, and uh, under the CIA, that production greatly increased, and the revenues um, from the sale of those drugs, which were flown out by CIA proprietary airlines, were used to further finance covert operations by the CIA. So, what the United States government did is to get was to get the ready cash to Elliot Abrams that allowed drugs, cocaine, to come into these poor communities all over the country as a means to then serve the secondary agenda, which is to sedate and control and criminalize as many of those black and Latin people that they can.
one of the effects is to take totally out of the political picture a whole generation or two of young black males who either get involved in the drug trade and end up in prison or who get involved in consumption and do not get involved in politics. It's the state that builds the archipelago of prisons. It's the state that invents a rhetoric of three strikes and you're out. It's the state that invents a vocabulary that is soaked in crime, which is meant to describe the lives of young people, adolescents, basically. I spent 19 years in prison in the United States for my political beliefs. You were the symbol that helped sustain me and other African American political prisoners. I say to you, brother, we love you and we will not give up the fight. 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 I think we've had uh, political prisoners in the United States for a very long time. Uh, on an official level, they would not uh, admit this. Of course there are political prisoners in the United States, even if the U.S. government will never admit to them. Political prisoners are the heartbeat of the struggle, reminders of what the struggle is really about. They have been behind the wall now 15, 20, and going on 25 years. They must not be forgotten. So while I'm sitting here in prison today with 115 witnesses, 532 exhibits, electronic surveillance, electronic eavesdropping, no fingerprints, no blood, no weapon, no words, nothing ever said against me. But I'm convicted. To this date, at least 800 pages of COINTELPRO and ADEX or Agitator Index files have been released to my lawyers in my name. Um, of course, thousands have not been. They're still classified. Uh, we believe that the Congressional Black Caucus should, should have a hearing to determine the effect of COINTELPRO on the new African independence movement, the black liberation movement, like they did to the left. That the parties responsible must admit their wrong in those attacks and uh, violation of those people's constitutional rights. It will then set a tone of reconciliation. a single stone or a grain of sand, as we are each individuals, if we change ourselves, if we do one small thing, it's much better than uh, people trying to do big things and for their self-aggrandizement. Government and the system, the industrial forces that are a plague on Mother Earth, that are destroying the water, uh, the air, the Earth itself, the genetic material within us all, um, it isn't just destroying it for uh, people in Africa or people in Southeast Asia um, or people in Latin America. It's destroying it for every being on Earth. And I mean every being, not only every man, woman, and child, I mean every living entity. All through history, no matter how much power has surged, through totalitarian, through empires, rulers and conquerors, whether they be governments or individuals as dictators or despots or tyrants, history has always shown that the human spirit will always prevail. We do not exist as individuals. All of us have a mother and a father. 
So we come from a collectivity of these two beings. We cannot ignore that and say, well, I am. Um, there is no I am. There is only we are. We are collective. All of us breathe the same air. Um, we share the same sunlight. Um, the feelings that I have in my heart are feelings that you have in your heart. We share spiritual vibrations. Love is natural. Hate is unnatural. Hate breeds hate. So, but you know, but I have never known where you have overcome hate with hate, but you can overcome hate with love and respect. I'll just say it in the words of Barb Molly: stand up for your rights. Don't let anybody tell you what you can and you cannot do. You can organize, you can educate, you can make a difference. We have to learn how to sit down and talk with each other first. Until we can sit down and talk, speak with each other, and sit down as, as men and women, uh, sit across from each other and break bre bread, and to learn that we're, we're human beings, I don't care you know, how, how, how low uh, you, uh, you are considered a, a, a in poverty or what national, nationality you are, or how rich you are. Uh, until we can learn to sit down with each other and discuss the problems, uh, we're not going to uh, be able to accomplish that. Revolution is, first of all, change, personal change, personal transformation. Revolution is not a word to be afraid of, because revolution is ultimately the most natural thing in the universe. Revolution is speaking truth to power. It is people recognizing their historical identity and their future uh, duty and necessity to transform this reality into a better reality. Um, I just want to be sure that uh, everyone knows that I still have the fire in the belly, that I'll do what I can to be as productive from here as I can, that I have legal cases that will put these issues in the public record and we will continue to uh, uh, share that with whoever, and that the international community should know that the new African independence struggle and the struggle for justice is live and well. It's dormant, but here comes the wind. Prima Mia. At the end of this journey, let us look inside our hearts with forgiveness, remembering not only the past and all those whose lives were sacrificed to violence, but let us also examine how we are going to survive together as humanity into the future, with peace and justice for all.